promise to start whenever I'll add it. I can right. always edit out the prompts. Okay, first, if you're to be ready. Last two people at trickle in and get some pieces. Did you already have my seat? Tommy? Yep, I got you. Are you? Take a second. Okay, slow intro. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so welcome everyone to the Tool Technology Seminar Series. Uh, this is the last seminar of the semester, um, so none next week, and then we'll start up again January, around mid of January, I think. I'll be sending out the new schedule um, for next semester pretty soon. I'll also later today be sending out an event for everyone's on the email listserv. Um, just for the semester, uh, please fill that out. It's really helpful. I have actually made some changes to personal information based on feedback. Also, the um, recommendations of speakers that I've received, I have reached out to them. They don't have a ton, but I do try. Um, but so I do really value and uh, appreciate the feedback that you guys do provide. So please do fill that in. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet. I'll bring it in the back with me if anyone hasn't signed up. Uh, I think that's all my announcements. So I'll introduce today's speaker. Uh, today's speaker is Yi Zhang, who is a grad student in DCMB from Yongzong's lab. And then you take it away. Okay, so hope everyone enjoys the uh, lunch. Here's the candy thing. Uh, yeah. uh, this what I will talk about my thesis project on this space. Structure prediction assisted by artificial intelligence, specifically deep convolutional neural networks. Okay. Uh, should I repeat that? Uh -oh. Let's go on. Okay. So, uh, in this talk, I will discuss uh, how we use deep neural network predicted residual residual distance to assist the novel protein folding. So uh, the protein structure prediction problem is that given uh, amino acid sequence of protein, how do we use computational algorithm to predict the tertiary structure? So uh, uh, early approach of this problem is use template-based modeling where you can search query sequence to the PDB database with experimentally determined protein structures. You can use the alignment between query and template and then uh, to, trans to get the structure of your query protein. So the problem is you don't always have a good template you can find from the PDB database. So the novel protein structure prediction is uh, to remove the dependence on uh, the protein on experimentally determined protein structure. Uh, why we why is this important? We will explain in next slide. So uh, why do we do the the novel or template free protein structure prediction? So on the right hand side we. I showed the accumulation of protein sequences in the Unipro database. Uh, so this is early in this year. I think now it's almost 400 million. So, and uh, amongst these many protein sequences, by the way, this is exponential, uh, this is log scale. So uh, the number of 
protein sequence in Unipro is extended exponentially. But the accumulation of structurally determined proteins in the PDB database is uh, just increased almost linearly. That means uh, one in a thousand protein has experimentally determined structure. For most proteins we care, we have to computationally model that structure. To model them is not that easy. For the, so here uh, I showed for the human and E. coli proteome, how many proteins can be modeled by template-based method, where the red easy portion are those that can be uh, modeled by uh, threading or template-based modeling. So for human and E. coli, around one third of their proteins cannot be confidently, uh, cannot be accurately modeled by template-based modeling, and they need the novel structure folding. So uh, these are the two most well-studied organisms. Uh, I once studied a, a strange virus called a Pandora virus, which has around 3,000 genes. 90% of the protein cannot be modeled by template-based modeling. So this is uh, similar to most of the organisms, most of the bacteria or other microbes in the world. So uh, the protein structure prediction problem is uh, actually quite uh, amenable to deep learning. So uh, in case you don't know, CAS, CAS or critical assessment of structure prediction is a biannual international challenge for protein structure folding. So uh, in CAS, on every two years, you have uh, the experimental groups will plan to determine the structure of around 100 proteins and ask every participant to predict the protein structure. And after half a year, you get a native structure, then you know how everyone is performing. So here we show uh, the ranking of template-based modeling. Uh, so each bar is one group. And the higher the bar, the better the performance. Zhang is Yang Zhang, my boss. Uh, this is iTaser. So this ranking is for all groups, including human group and server group. Where server are automatic server that must be must submit their model within three days, and human groups can submit their model after two or three weeks. So in other words, uh, the human groups can. Uh, check the result of the server groups, so they are not completely automated. Uh, this is Yang Zhang, this is iTaser, uh, this is Alpha 4 or A7D. And uh, all these groups, they use deep learning. So this is for template-based modeling. And for uh, all protein stru prediction structure of all proteins, uh, for server, the first rank group is Quark, uh, which is the th my thesis project, and then iTaser, and then uh, Raptor and Rosetta. And uh, for human groups, then your upper four was the uh, top, but uh, DeepMind has made some um, misleading announcement that they win, they win, they win everyone in CAS. Actually, they just win in one category. But uh, anyway, we should give them credit as they are really doing a good job. And also, there's uh, a sub challenge called contact prediction. So uh, I will explain what is contact prediction later. And also, in this category, TripleRes and Rest Triple is the program we develop, and we are also ranking as the top. Now, uh, actually, all these has 13 groups except for Rosetta, they all use deep learning. So why deep learning is particularly suitable for protein structure prediction? Uh, that's because in a tertiary protein structure, the structure is usually stable by pairwise residual-residual interaction. 
So the cartoon is the backbone and the stick shows the side chain. So we can define two residues to be in contact if the C beta, so the distance between the C beta atom is within A and strong. And predicting which residue pairs are in contact is, can be actually formularized as a image segmentation problem. So in an image segmentation problem, or, or you can also say a pixel level labeling problem, you have an image that has different colors or different feature channels. Your goal is given this input image, uh, label each pixel what kind of object is on this image, say an elephant or uh, the background or the grass. Now, uh, in contact prediction, a uh, contact map can be considered as an image where the x-axis and the y-axis are both the residual index from 1 to L, where L is the length of space. So this image is symmetric, and one point means one residual pair. A black dot means two residues are in contact, and a white point means they are not in contact. Uh, we don't need to care that much uh, on the diagonal, because obviously if two residues are close together in a sequence, they should also be in contact. So the important part is this, it is those that are far away from the diagonal. Now, in uh, contact prediction, the color or the input feature is the multiple sequence alignment for your query sequence. So, uh, we, we formulate it as an image segmentation problem, where for a two-dimensional map, we try to label each pixel or each residual pair is in contact or not, then this is a classical problem for deep convolutional neural network. So in our, so why, how can we uh, use a multiple sequence alignment to predict this? Now, suppose we have, this is our query sequence. So starting from this query sequence, we can find their sequence homologs. Uh, these sequence homologs don't have to have tertiary structure, and even if they don't, we don't care. Uh, even if they do or don't, we don't care. We search the query sequence to potent sequence database and get this alignment. Now, if you notice this position, when this position convert from V to D, this position also convert from F to K. So it's unlike, uh, this position is completely conserved, so there, there is mutation. It doesn't have any mutation. Or when this mutation converts to R to V, this position it converts from R to V, its mutation does not happen, does not have any correlation with other position. But when this position converts from V to D, it also converts from F to K. That means these two residues, they are, evolu they are evolutionary coupled. And we can use this evolutionary coupling information to uh, infer whether these two positions, they are close together in the tertiary structure. And uh, the multiple sequence alignment can uh, express as a three-dimensional matrix for N sequence, L amino acid per sequence, and 20 amino acid type plus the gap. The evolutionary coupling is a 21L by 21L matrix. Uh, L, L is the length of so L is the length of sequence and 21 is the amino acid type. And uh, so this if, so this express the uh, correlation between different amino acid type at different amino at different position in the protein sequence. Our goal is to uh, predict beta or the evolutional, evolutionary coupling given the multiple sequence alignment. We can do this by uh, maximum likelihood. So we can uh, 
use train rule to write, rewrite this into this, where xin is the amino acid type at, oh, so amino acid type at position i for the m sequence. Then uh, we can, this probability can express like this. We can put the uh, product outside as a summation. Then this can be solved by maximum likelihood estimation. So given, Question. yes. Are I and J adjacent along the linear sequence? They don't have to be. Can they be in any position in three dimensions? Any, any two positions. They don't have to be adjacent in the, pro, in the primary sequence. So, uh, given the theta, then we can use it to predict the two-dimensional contact map, which is L by L, an L by L image, using deep convolutional neural network. So, uh, this process is the process I described here, where we get a theta. Then the theta is one kind of input feature. We can fed it to a deep convolutional neural network to predict a L by L, uh, contact, actually the contact prediction, not a distance prediction. Uh, uh, so this is, uh, this pipeline is called C quark, where uh, we use the convolutional neural network, so in this slide, to predict the two-dimensional contact map. Uh, and this contact map is used to guide a Monte Carlo simulation, which also include other statist statistical energy terms to assemble shock uh, structure fragments to full-length sequence uh, using a Monte Carlo simulation. This Monte Carlo simulation has uh, many uh, different geometry operations. We also call movements. So each movement, you either change a little bit of the structure or uh, coherently change a lot, uh, 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 rotate a large part of the structure. By uh, sampling the conformation, we can generate a large number of conformations. And then we cluster them and we it into an atomic model. Now, oh, uh, this is the pipeline we use in CAS 12 and, uh, and also in CAS 13. So uh, this is the native structure of a protein and, we, and the dashed line is the predicted context. And here is the uh, sequent model we predict for this structure, which has a high TM score of 0.8. And TM score is a measurement of how good is the structure model. Uh, the higher, the better. And DI is the distance between the, uh, of the residual I between the native and the predicted structure after civil position. So uh, the higher, the better. And we can see the Y axis is uh, the structure prediction pipeline with predicted content and X axis is without context. And after adding the context, we can uh, significantly improve the structure quality as almost all points are on the upper diagonal. Oh, sorry, the TM score is 0 0.7, not 0 0.8. So uh, this was the old pipeline in the test 13. But, but now we are developing an, another newer pipeline where we don't just predict the pairwise, whether we don't just predict the contact. So for residues that are in contact, we also predict the real value distance. So contact map is just a binary map, just a yes or no, whether they are in contact. And distance map is, uh, for each residue, is a histogram. And uh, in this histogram, each each bar is a probability of whether a residual pair is within a distance, for example, from 9.5 to 10 angstrom. So uh, 
we can use almost the same architecture to predict the distance distribution, and then we can fit a Gaussian curve to estimate what is the real value distance. Uh, uh, how do we uh, predict the distance is uh, by using almost the same architecture, but now instead of a L by L by one, uh, prediction, we have a L by L by 22 uh, prediction. And 22 means the number of different distance beings for one residue pair. So we use a similar Monte Carlo simulation by adding the predicted distance. And uh, the structure modeling quality can be significantly improved. So here is the average TM score of around 100 protein structures. And here is uh, the number of target proteins whose TM score can be, uh, whose TM score is greater than 0 0.5, means the, uh, the structure prediction has a good quality. So C quark means I only use contact, and D quark means uh, I use both contact and predicted distance. So uh, we can improve the modeling quality by eight to nine percent. So the conclusion is predicted residual residual distance significantly improved the novel structure prediction over content assisted protein folding. And uh, that is the uh, major part of how I do the distance prediction and structure folding. So uh, I didn't talk. Oh, hmm? why is? Well, I, maybe I make the slide order incorrect. So one part I didn't talk too much is uh, how do we how do we generate the multiple sequence alignment here? So this is this actually turned out to be a quite. Uh, critical part in the whole pipeline because all our predictions, including the contact, the distance, and also local structure property, <coughs> like secondary structure and so accessibility, are all based on the input multiple sequence alignment. So uh, I used around two to three months to tune the pipeline. And uh, so, uh, so the pipeline is like this. Starting from a query sequence, I use HH splits, which is a hidden Markov model based model to search the unicast protein sequence database to get a multiple sequence alignment. If the number of sequences is too small, then I will do the second step, where I use another hidden Markov model-based method to get to get the raw sequence hit. And uh, these sequence hits are converted to HHBLIS format and use this sequence profile to search this database to get this multiple sequence alignment. So this two step only use traditional whole genome sequence derived protein sequence. And if these two steps uh, obtain a small number of protein sequence, I will perform a first step where we will search MetaCAS, which is a meta genome database. Then I also convert it to HHBase format to get a Final uh, alignment. So uh, with this, with uh, the three stage, I can improve the contact prediction accuracy by around four percent. And uh, this work is uh, now uh, accepted by bioinformatics. So this is just a, a simplified pipeline that I'm trying to develop, but I haven't finished this part yet. Yes. Is there a reason why you chose one twenty eight? Number of results you needed. So uh, this is what uh, we uh, we tune empirically. There's no theoretical justification, 
uh, what we find is that um, you don't always get improvement when you get more sequence. In fact, if your number of if, it, yeah, if your number of effective sequence is greater than one twenty eight, adding more sequence will just make more noise because the more sequence you have, the more difficult for it to align accurately. So that's a little detail. So and uh, also I didn't talk uh, much about uh, how why do we use why do we how do we use the protein structure? But actually, from the protein structure dialog, you can predict you can uh, use the structure to find structure templates in the protein database with function annotation. From where we can predict the uh, gene ontology terms, ligand binding sites. And uh, and some commission and some and some commission number and other function annotations. So uh, here is a pipeline we developed for the human protein together with you, and uh, we include both the structure information and the protein protein interaction network and the sequence homologs to derive a consensus protein function prediction. For and uh, for human protein. So uh, with that, uh, I would like to thank everyone for coming. So here is my uh, thesis committee member, and uh, apart from my main mentor Peter and uh, Yang, Peter and Gil, who are my uh, unofficial co-mentors, also participate, also uh, guide me to the protein function prediction pipeline, and where. Uh, my wife Xiao Q is a small part of it. She's here, and uh, with that, I would like to take questions. Yes. So um, I want to follow up on what Catherine asked, and uh, so you said that having more sequences does not necessarily improve the quality uh, of the prediction, which sort of makes sense. Uh, have you tried, like, I guess, you know, what I'm wondering is to what extent the results are influenced by uh, what sequences you select? I mean, I'm not sure how you can test that because, I mean, at this point, I imagine that the uh, sequences are so distant, so just like, you know, no insight that you can provide. Like, you know, have you tested, like, you know, somehow what, how, the, the sequences you select that affect the results. Okay. Oh. Uh, Are you asking like whether or not if they are <clears throat> like more evolutionarily distant? Yeah. Right. Okay. <laughs> so the yeah. So the set of sequences. So this uh, 128 sequences versus like you know. A subset of these plus more, I guess. Yeah, really. that's what I'm really yeah. wondering. So when we put, when we uh, train the cut off, then uh, so we are using we uh, use the content prediction to train the cut off. Here, uh, the y axis is the accuracy of content prediction. So obviously, the higher the better, and the x axis is the different cut off of the number of effective sequence. Sure. And then uh, we find that uh, after you reach 128, your your result don't improve anymore. Right. So why yeah. there's a, a empirical cut off? I, I no, can't. that makes perfect sense. But what I'm asking is uh, how is, are the results affected by which uh, sequences you select, right? So have you done some kind of, I don't know, maybe... Uh, uh, excuse me, what do you mean by which sequence I select? Okay, so uh, if you select more sequences, it, I believe that, I understand that. But uh, if you 
sort of, you know, have 148 sequences, for example, right? So, and uh, you have, you know, maybe 50 more. If you, uh, you know, take some of these out and add other sequences, is that going to affect your predictions? Right. The, so, the sequences that you selected. Right. Uh, so, so the same total number, but different sets. Uh, so, for example, uh, I have, I, I somehow I find 400 sequence. Sure. So should I, should I just select a subset of 128, or if if so, which subset I should select? Is that's a question, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. So, uh, if for So in our pipeline, uh, so for, for example, if one stage I find 200 sequence, right. then I would just I would just use this MSA all of it. And if it's less than 128 number of effective sequence, then we will we will start we will uh, continue with the next stage until the sequence reach the cutoff. So okay. upon you reach that upon so after your number of effective sequence reach the threshold, whether you only choose a subset or you use all of it, it won't make much difference. Mm -hmm. So as we saw in the previous talk, uh, after reaching 128, you select more or select less, the result is about the same. So my answer is you don't need to worry about that. Just okay. use all of it, it's okay. Yes. So in the DQuirk pipeline, you use both contact information and distance information. Both of those come from the same source and generally address the same uh, concept of inter-residue distance. So how are the two complementary to each other in the actual DQuirk simulation? So I do not completely agree with you that they are for the same source. So it is correct that they have they are. Uh, Improved features are all derived from the multiple sequence alignment. But different predictors, they use different neural network architecture and different loss function to train their model. So uh, we have tested that, at least in CQAP, you only include the best contact predictor. It's not as good as you include like count reporting different diverse contact predictors because you increase the diversity you can uh, you can uh, always improve the modeling accuracy right but I'm, I'm asking between distance and contact so if you network. train the same neural network to predict both contact and distance then of course you won't I, I will assume it won't make much difference using both contact and distance or just using distance. But we don't. They are they they are trained differently. So they are still complementary to each other because their training is different. Okay, so then would you say if if diversity is the only way they are complementary to each other, if you used a bunch of different distance predictors instead of the contact predictor, would you also see the same sort of increase in performance? We do. In fact, that we not only use our predictor, we also use uh, David Jones and other groups distance predictor. It, it does improve. So you can effectively remove contact prediction from the pipeline by adding a bunch of other distance. Uh, well, uh, I guess the best is now is you appropriately combine all of it. Great. And uh, actually, by the way, I forgot to show our server. So we don't have the latest server with the distance prediction, but we do have the server for uh, contact-based, contact-assisted protein structure prediction where you can put your sequence here and then you can run the result and the result looks like this where you have your sequence, you have your secondary structural prediction, so on accessibility 
your uh, predictive contact map and then your different structure and you can rotate and play around or download. Are there any other questions? All right, thank you.